let's get going. So again, I really appreciate everybody's flexibility um, for attending on Zoom. I know it's not as fun as meeting in person, but um, you know, you make do with what you have and be thankful for the technology. So um, I hope you're all having a good day so far. Um, just to remind you, um, lesson two, online homework um, in the My Open Math is due tonight um, by midnight. I just looked in the grade book and most everybody has um, already engaged in it. But for those of you who have not yet started it, it is due tonight by midnight. So please be sure you get that done. Um, and as you know, we finished up lesson three yesterday in class. So the lesson three online homework is due um, a week from yesterday. Additionally, um, in terms of like the written activities that, that y'all get to work on, um, activity two is due now. Um, once class is over, I will make the, um, I, I'll make the um, solutions visible on the class Moodle page. So please be sure you get that email to me today um, as soon as possible. And then um, I will, I announced yesterday in class that I will be handing out activity three on Friday in class. And for anybody who's not there, of course, I will make it available on the class Moodle page. So are there any questions about due dates or anything like that? Yes, I can definitely um, jump in and do um, a couple more problems um, from that we left off with yesterday. Thanks, Riley, for asking. Are there any other questions? Okay, so um, all right, let's. Uh, I'm just going to make up a question and um, I'll, I'll go through maybe um, about three or four parts and, and hopefully this will help. But Riley and everyone else, um, please feel free to um, unmute or put in chat if you have any questions whatsoever. Okay, please. All right, so I don't know, I guess I'm going to be a little bit goofy here. Um, so how about, um, we say that, um, we're going to talk about a jury, but instead of going into the gender realm, we're going to say that a jury, um, is composed of 12, um, let's see, um, Canines. We'll talk about dogs. I'm out of town for my dog, so I'll think about her. And um, suppose there is a pool of 25 canines, um, 14 are short hair and 11 are long here. All right, and so essentially what I'm saying is there's 25 canines, 14 short hair, 11 long hair, and they need to pick a jury of 12 um, in order to um, go to some trial for maybe a dog taking someone else's dog's bone. So what I want to know is in how many ways can the jury be selected if, how about part A, there are no restrictions? Okay. Now, when I talk about no restrictions, that doesn't mean um, Anything about order mattering, not order mattering, okay? That's implicit in the question. It just means that we're not being particular here about how many long-haired and short-haired dogs 
are going to serve on the jury. Okay, so the first thing that I want to mention is whenever you're asked in how many ways something can happen, we know that we're counting. So the, the next question that we then have to ask is, are we going to be using the multiplication principle or are we going to be using combinations? And in order to answer that, what we have to ask ourselves is, does order matter? Okay, so recall that when order matters, we use the multiplication principle. So essentially, telephone numbers, zip codes, PIN numbers, um, a schedule is arranged, or if we categorize first, second, third, et cetera. Okay, in this situation, I, I um, venture to say that order does not matter. Once those 12 dogs are selected, they're all on the jury, okay? So because order doesn't matter here, we're going to be using a combination. So since there's no restrictions, what we wanna ask ourselves is how many total canines do we have to choose from? What are you gonna say? And I'd love it if people unmuted or chatted, um, then I won't feel so alone. Right on, thank you so much. We've got 25 total canines, and how many are we choosing? Good, we're choosing 12, okay? Again, you can write this in many different ways, and then you can use a calculator to compute it. And we have 25, choose 12, Holy smokes, look at this. We've got 5,200,300 different ways that we can make this jury. Are there questions on this? Okay, then how about we want to know in how many ways can the jury be selected if um, we want exactly six short hair puppies and six long hair puppies. Okay, so what are we going to do here? Notice here, we're starting to put some restrictions. Now I'm telling you how I want my 12 jurors to be composed, okay? So what do we do? We again note that it's a combination. That's not going to change in the context of this question. How many short hair dogs do we have to choose from? Right on. We've got 14 short hair dogs. And how many long hair dogs do we have to choose from? 11. Okay, and notice we want six of each. Okay, again, I'm gonna point out that check mechanism that of course at this point won't seem very relevant, but we will be getting to where it is. Notice that my top numbers add up to my total of 25 and my bottom numbers add up to my total sample size. Okay, questions here? And I'll let you compute that um, unless anybody has a question and wants me to push the buttons in front of you. My brother would say I'm really good at pushing buttons. So <laughs> anyhow. All right, then for part C, why don't we say in how many ways can the jury be selected if at least 10 must be short hair canines. All right, so this is where we get to um, the situation where we might have more than one possibility. Okay. Again, once you see at least, at most, no more than, no less than, 
you need to be open to the fact that we're going to be using the word or, and there's probably more than one possibility. So let me ask you this, what does at least 10 mean in the context of this question? Well, I claim it means that we want 10 short hair or 11 short hair or 12 short hair. Do I stop there? I have 14 short hair dogs. Yeah. Thank you. I do stop here. Okay. Note that I'm stopping right here because I'm bounded by the total number of dogs that I'm going to be selecting. Okay. And I'm only selecting 12. So even though there's 14 to choose from, I'm stopping because I'm limited by my sample size. So the first step we did, we wanted to translate. Now, my next step that we were working through is we want to account for the rest of our sample. Notice we're picking a total of 12 dogs. If 10 of them are short hair, what do we know? Two are long hair. Thank you. Two are long hair. If 11 are short hair, what do we know? One. One long hair. And if 12 are short hair, would you grant me that none are long hair? Notice Four. I'm still picking 12 jurors. Any questions this far? All right. Well, remember that or tells us plus. So I'm going to have three separate terms. And again, this tells us how many of each we're going to pick, but we have to keep in mind that we're always starting out choosing from a pool of 14 short haired dog and 11 long haired dogs. Okay. So the cool thing about taking our time and doing this is now we have the bottom numbers for each one of these, right? We know that we have 14 to choose from. And in this situation, we want 10 of the short hairs and two of the long hairs. Here we have 11 and one, and then we have 12 and zero. Notice again, um, each of these terms and terms are things separated by plus or minus signs. The top numbers add up to my total of 25, and my bottom numbers add up to my total of 12. Now, on a test, um, I wouldn't ask you to compute something this long, um, just because that's not how I want you to be spending your test time, number one. And number two, it's really easy to hit a wrong button or make a typo, okay? But I would ask you to set it up. On the online homework, you do need to do the computations. So let me just do one more part. Are there questions on this part? Okay, I'll take silences that you're all good. What if now, instead of wanting at least 10 to be short hair, what if I want at least 10 of the jurors to be long haired puppy dogs. All right, notice I'm still using the at least but I claim that something a little funky happens here. Now, what are our possibilities? 10 or 11. 10 or 11. Awesome. You all, you're doing so well. So now we're gonna have 10 long hairs or 10, or excuse me, 
or 11 long hairs. But wait a minute, I'm picking 12. How come I stopped here? because I only had 11 long haired dogs to choose from. So the point that I wanna make is that your possibilities can be limited by two things. One thing it can be limited by is the size of the sample, which is where we were here. But another thing that we can be limited by is the total number we have to choose from. So, in this case, this is our only, these are our only scenarios. And again, if there's going to be a total of 12 jurors and 10 have long hair, how many dogs are short hair? We have two. And here, would you grant me that we have one? Yeah. Awesome. I appreciate the responses, thank you. I know it's kind of awkward talking out in this um, sort of environment. All right, so now since I'm starting with long hairs, I need to make sure that I have my numbers straight. Again, you could put 14 first and 11 second, but since I was talking about long hair first, I wanna make sure that I keep my order correct. And now in this case, we want 10 long haired dogs and two short haired dogs. And here, 11 long haired dogs and one short haired dog. Does this help? Yeah. Awesome, awesome. So I actually am going to, um, do something real quick. Thank you for asking this because you reminded me of something that I want to point out. Um, just give me one moment. I'm going to our class Moodle page. Okay. Um, I'm going to share my screen for a moment. So um, if you go to our class Moodle page, this is where we go for our class activities. Um, but what I did um, remember to do yesterday before I split town is notice the entry here is documents. I posted a few documents here for you. <laughs> um, and I guess I should change the order. If anybody wants to do more practice with these combinations, other than what um, you have on the online homework, this is not for a grade. That's why it's posted in the documents, as opposed to um, as opposed to um, the class activities. But if you want more practice with the combinations, I have them here, and over here I have solutions for them. <clears throat> this document is one where you're not doing any computations, but all we're asking is, would you use combinations to solve this or would you use the multiplication principle? In other words, does order matter? In which case the multiplication principle or does it not matter? And if you open up this document, you will see that um, the solutions are um, on a, an additional page. So yes, I, um, I'm really glad that I remembered this partway through talking to you about um, the previous example. So again, these are here for extra practice if it would be helpful for you. And because um, they're extra practice, of course, I have the solutions post. Can you repeat that whether what's the order matters doesn't matter with the combo and the multiplication? Sure. Um, with um, com here, I'm going to actually share my screen and write it down. With the multiplication principle, order matters. Um, with combinations, order does not matter. So again, order doesn't matter when you're picking a sample or you're picking a committee and everybody has the same sort of roles. Thank you. Thank you.
You have no idea how much I appreciate y'all speaking out and asking questions. I'm sitting here in a room that's just echoing, so. All right. So what I wanna do now is I wanna jump into lesson four. This is actually a really exciting section because we're actually get to start probability. Now, one comment that I wanna make is that we have lesson four to do and lesson five to do. When we complete lesson five, we will be taking our first in-class test. I'll always give you a week's notice. This is all on your syllabus. So um, on the back of the syllabus, um, you can see kind of a, our broad calendar. But I just wanted you to uh, be aware that we have two more um, sections to go through and then we will have our first test, okay? So this set section, lesson four, will actually take us a bit of time to get through. There's a lot in this section. And when I say there's a lot in this section, it's not a lot of math necessarily, but a lot of concepts, okay? So at the start of this section, what I'm going to do is give you a fair number of definitions. Um, as I've stated several times in the class, you obviously don't need to memorize any of these definitions. You just need, um, I just need to be sure that we're all on the same page so that when I use a term, we're all speaking that same language, okay? So this is rather exciting, I think, because we're finally getting into um, some of our probability. But before I jump into um, the, the mathematical definition of probability and the necessary terminology for it, what I wanna first point out is there's different ways um, to view probability. I mean, when we talk about the probability of something or the likelihood of something, that term is used very loosely. And there's actually three different um, ways that you can view it. So just briefly, I wanna say that the first one that many do is experimental probability. And that's when you repeatedly conduct an experiment. So you can take, for example, um, a, a coin and toss it several times, and you could look experimentally how many heads come up versus how many tails come up, and therefore compute the probability. Another time that this comes into play that people tend to um, use a lot in their life is like with a weather report. If somebody says that there's a 20% chance of snow, what does that mean when a meteorologist says that? Well, what it means is using historical data on days similar um, to today with similar weather patterns, it snowed 20% of the time, okay? <clears throat> so this is done quite frequently. Another one, is subjective probability, and that's an educated guess. So for example, suppose the Grizz football team is playing this weekend and um, it's a team that we've beat several times in the past. We could say that the probability that the Grizz are gonna win is like 80%, okay? We can't really conduct an experiment on that but we're making that sort of educated guess there. And then the final sort of probability is theoretical probability, and that's our focus, okay? And um, this kind of assumes that we live in a vacuum or in a perfect world where each outcome is equally likely, okay? So what we assume here 
when we're talking about theoretical probability is that there are equally likely outcomes. I mean, for example, when you flip a coin, um, you know, people say, well, there's a 50-50 chance. And that's assuming that it's equally likely to land on a head or a tail. Um, similar with a die, like when you roll a dice, like say a six-sided die, um, one would say that there's a one-sixth probability of landing on any one of those sides. The thing is, quality control is not that good. They're not you know, weighted perfectly. So while theoretically landing on any particular side of a coin or a die is equally likely in practice, um, because the quality control just is such that um, companies obviously don't want to spend money to care that much about it. That's not often what happens. Okay. But that's what we're assuming here. So we're assuming that we live in a vacuum or a perfect world. Okay. Um, another way that I can kind of contrast these different um, sorts of ideas is, um, okay, I'm sitting in a room and one could say that either the ceiling is going to fall down on me right now or it's not going to fall down on me right now. Okay. Are those equally likely outcomes? One hopes not, right? Otherwise, <laughs> we're really chancing things here. So, you know, and at that point, we would say, you know, our educated guess is that the ceiling is not going to fall down on me right now. Okay. So now I want to get into some terminology. Like, why have we been talking about sets so far? Okay. Well, in fact, in order to define, um, probability, we need to talk about various sets. So I'm going to write some terminology down. And you can either write this down or not write this down as the case may be. But again, it's so that when I use these terms, we all know what I'm talking about. So I'm going to tell you that an experiment is an activity with an observable re result. Okay, flipping a coin, um, tossing a die, spinning a spinner, any sort of thing like that can be an experiment, okay? Each repetition, in other words, each time we conduct the experiment is called a trial. The possible results are called outcomes. And the set, notice, of all possible outcomes is what we call our sample space. And what I want you to think about when we think about our sample space is think about the universe. When we were talking about um, like complements of sets and that sort of thing, we had our universal set. Okay. And last but not least, a selection of outcomes is called an event. Lots of words, okay? But notice we're bringing into our conversation the whole notion of sex. So let's take an example and talk about this because I will ask you to write um, the sample space of various experiments, okay? And various events as well. So let's just start out right now with saying, let's suppose that we're rolling a fair six-sided die, okay? Notice I'm saying it's fair. Implicit in that, I'm saying that it's equally likely to land on any one of those six sides, 
Okay. So I want to write my sample space. In other words, I want to write out the set of all possible outcomes. Okay. Remember, when we're writing a set, we always name it with a capital letter. When I write my sample space, I tend to use S again because of my lack of originality here. <laughs> and remember, we write our curly braces. So, what are our possible outcomes? What could we roll on a six sided die? Uh, one through six. You got it. We could roll a one, two, three, four, five, or six. And if you want to like put the dots there, you're welcome to. I'm kind of lazy about that. Questions there? All right. So now what I want us to do is write some events. So what is my event rolling, say, an even number? Now this becomes my universe, okay? This is the set of all possible outcomes. So we're not talking about, um, you know, the number 100, which is an even number, because that's not in our particular universe. Okay, I'm going to call this set E for even number. So given that this is my set of all possible outcomes, what are my even numbers here? How about two, four, and six? Right, even numbers are numbers that are divisible by two. Any questions here? Okay. What if now I want to talk about the event rolling an odd number? I'll call that set O. What would I have in this set? Well, one, three, which five. of my five? Awesome. One, three, and five. Would you grant me that E and O are disjoint sets? You may or may not remember that term. And I'm just saying it to bring it back to you. When you have two sets that are disjoint, that means they have nothing in common. Okay, in other words, E intersect O equals the empty set, right? When you do the intersection, you're asking what they have in common. We could also say that these are complementary events. This isn't a term I use a ton, but in case you read through the text, I want you to be aware of what I'm talking about. Questions this far? Okay, let's just go through a few more events pertaining to rolling a die. What if I wanna write the event rolling a number greater than nine? I'll call that set N for nine. What's in that set? Well, is there a number greater than nine in my sample space? No. So we would say this is equal to the empty set. And when that sort of thing happens, we say that's an impossible event. Again, don't get caught up in these terms, please. But I just want you to be aware of them um, as, as we proceed through the class. Okay, what if I want to write the event rolling a number less than 20? I'll call that set T for 20. What's in that set? All the numbers? You got it. Good job. Good job. 
you could either write out, well, that is absolutely every possibility, or you could say, oh, it's just equal to my sample space. When that happens, we call that a certain event. Right, we're guaranteed that that event is going to happen. All right, just so that I can introduce one more term here. What if I want us to list the event rolling a number larger than five? I'll call this set F for five. Notice it's larger than five. I don't say um, at least five. At least five would mean that we're counting five. So what numbers in my sample space are greater than five? Right on. Aren't you glad you go to college to be asked questions like that? Okay, so the reason why I ask this is when an event just has one element in it, it's called a simple event. I'm not gonna ask you, you know, define an impossible certain or simple event, but I want you to be aware of these terms. Are there questions this far? Isn't this pretty chill so far? Ish? Yes. <laughs> and, and you don't have to agree if, if, you, if, if you don't, but anyway. <clears throat> All right, let's do a different experiment. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to toss two fair coins. And what I want us to do is write the sample space. Okay, so maybe I'm tossing a nickel and I'm tossing a dime. Okay, well, what are all the possibilities that we could get here? Notice each one of these outcomes, each element in here is going to consist of whatever happens with each of these coins. So I'll get us started. Do you agree one possibility is I could get a head on my nickel and a head on my dime? So given that, what's another possibility? Tails, tails. I could get a tail and a tail. Good job. What else could I get? Good, thank you. I could get a head and a tail. And I claim there's one more that I could get. Good job. You're all doing awesome. Okay. Again, these are two different coins. And so head tail is different than tail head. All right, one more experiment that I'm going to do. This is a two-step experiment. What I'm going to do is I'm gonna spin a spinner and toss a coin, okay? So what's that game that, um, you have that spinner and you have to put your hand or your foot on different colors. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Twister. Twister, Twister that's it. Do people still play that? Maybe. Okay. So when I'm saying that we're going to spin a spinner, pretend there's like a little arrow and you can go and it goes around and around. So what I'm assuming here is that it's equally likely to land on red, yellow, or blue, okay? So it's weighted just evenly and these three um, areas are the same. And do you agree with tossing a coin? I'm either gonna get a head or a tail. All right, 
So this is a two-part experiment. And what I want us to do here is write our sample space. Just like up here, this was kind of a two-step um, two experiment because we were doing more than one action. So within each of our outcomes, it's gonna have something from here and something from here. So would you grant me that one possibility is I could spin my spinner on a red and I could toss a head. <laughs> that does not sound very pleasant. <laughs> What's another possibility? Well, how about I could spin my spinner on a red and I could get a tail. Someone else want to chime in on another possibility? Good, I could spin it on a yellow and get a head. And yellow tail, good job. And then BH and BT. Good job, everybody. Okay. Now, something that I want to point out is you don't need to write then H R T R H Y T Y H B T B. It's still getting, I mean, these two things are considered the same. You've still got a blue on your spinner and a tail on the coin. Unless order matters in less order matters. But in these sorts of experiments, when they're two-step experiments, order tends not to matter here, but that's a very important point. Something else that I wanna mention just to kind of tie together with the multiplication principle. How many possible outcomes are there for spinning a spinner? Three, good job. How many possible outcomes are there for tossing a coin? Two, three times two. Oh my goodness, that's exactly how many um, elements were in our sample space. Notice up here, we're tossing two coins. How many possible outcomes are there for our first coin? Well, we could get a head or a tail, correct? So aren't there two possibilities with our first coin and two possibilities for our second coin? And two times two gave us four. I'm just trying to um, link these sorts of things. Pretty cute, huh? Yes. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> So what I'm going to do now, um, and I'm going to leave you hanging for, um, for class on Friday, is I'm going to talk about a deck of cards right now, okay? Um, cards are something that we talk about a lot with probability, okay? But the thing is, um, playing cards is a very American thing to do, not all cultures play cards very often or are very familiar with the deck of cards. So what I'm going to tell you right now is I'm going to do some examples with cards because they're really helpful and insightful and um, get to a lot of things with the probabilities. And you may have homework questions that involve cards, but I will not put any test questions that involve a deck of cards. Okay, simply because not everybody is extremely familiar with a deck of cards. And so I don't want to add that extra level of uh, co cognitive dissonance. Okay, but when you're doing your homework and we're doing things in class, you can have this right in front of you. And so um, what I'm going to do right now is just talk to you about the basic information about a deck of cards. Does anyone know how many cards are in a deck? Fifty-two. Does anyone here like to play cribbage, by the way? There's no cribbage. Oh, you do? I love cribbage. I love cribbage. Okay. Anyway, that's my version of cards. 
So there's 52 cards in a deck. Okay. So some things about cards, and again, you don't have to have these memorized if you don't know about cards, just have this in front of you when we start playing with them. Half the cards are red and half the cards are black. Okay. Another characteristic of cards that make them really fun um, to do probability questions with is that there's four suits when we talk about cards, okay? Two of them are gonna be red, two of them are gonna be black. The red suits are diamonds and hearts and the black suits are clubs and spades. Well, there's 13 of each of these. Next, we have things called face cards. I'm just gonna tell you that for our purposes, aces are not face cards. Our face cards are jack, queens, and kings. And we have a jack, queen, and king of each of these four suits. So we have a jack, queen, king of diamonds, of hearts, of clubs, and spades. So what you need to know is that there's a total of 12 face cards. And the last thing that I'm going to say is that for each suit, we have an ace, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, jack, queen, and king. So we have each of these of diamonds, each of these of hearts, each of these of clubs, and each of these of spades. All right, keep this in mind. Um, this is probably a really good place to stop, but what's really awesome is on Friday, I get to start out by formally defining probability, which I think is super cool. So um, did this go okay for everybody today? Yeah. Cool, cool. Well, I really appreciate you all coming. Um, I know that it's it's kind of funky to meet this way, but um, I appreciate your flexibility and I sure look forward to seeing everybody for real on, on Friday. Thanks. Thank you.